apparently I realised I do that a lot. Um, basically start everything with, oh, all right, that's just like my catchphrase, apparently. Um, because going through, apparently nobody noticed. But apparently every, every service that when I, I do the thing, I know, how, I know when to start the message. Um, because I go, oh, all right, <laughs> or something like that. So now everybody's going to be listening for it. <laughs> so, what? I noticed that if you know. Did you? Good for you. Glad you noticed something. Stop biting your nails. Okay, what we're going to talk about tonight. I said, okay, not all right. <laughs> I've broken it already. Hallelujah. Praise Lord. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about legions. Now, we, t- we talked about briefly uh, last week about legion. Well, what I want to do is I want to do a little bit more advanced on that. There's, you know, there's a specific spirit of legion that we can look at. But what it seems to me is we're going to look at some scriptures here in the Bible. And we're going to ask ourselves, why is the name legion associated with this specific strong man? In Mark chapter 5 and verse 9, he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, my name is legion, for we are many. So we're going to ask the question, why is the name legion associated this with many? All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus. I ask for your blessings, I ask for your protection tonight, Lord, in these things that we do. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us and, and help us. Let us understand the things that you have for us, Lord, and help us to, to uh, further our strength and further uh, us taking um, uh, ground back from Satan's kingdom and, and sanctifying it to you, Lord. Help us to have the victories in, uh, in each one of our lives, in all of our lives, in every aspect of our life. May we have the victory and be fully delivered from all these things. Lord, we thank you. We pray you be with us now. Bless us and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So why would we say the name Legion? Why, what does Legion have to do with being many? A group of people. Okay. What? A legion of soldiers. Okay. So let's look at something else. Bible says here in the next verse, in Mark, uh, Mark 5, verse 13, it says, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place in the sea. There were about 2,000, and they were choked in the sea. So we find that there was at least 2,000 spirits in this man. And they called himself Legion, for we are many. Right? And so we find that uh, we said there was 2,000 here. But then we also, we've discussed this before, that uh, Mary Magdalene has said that, she, that out of her was cast seven devils. Well, why was it a big deal that seven were cast out of her when this man had 2,000? Surely you'd think this 2,000, this is a big deal. And we're not saying that there was 2,000. We're saying that there was, there was 2,000 pigs. Did each pig have one demon or did they have several? This is the question. But why is Mary Magdalene's so specific? It says seven devils. I mean, seven compared to 2,000 is not a great deal. But if we understand that we're talking about seven strong men. So she had seven legions. Not just one legion like this man. She had seven legions in this way. And what we need to understand is the legion is not necessarily one spirit, but a ruling spirit. And now, when I started studying and started looking at these things, and the more we've come across... Uh, spiritual for- warfare and the more we've taken things down and the things that we we'll be using the tactics that we use it seems to me that uh, that there's a similarity between the way the Roman army is set up or was set up and the way Satan's kingdom is set up especially when we talk about referring to legion now you say well oh, wow Satan models kingdom after the, Ro- the Roman army no it's the other way around the Roman army modeled their methods after Satan's kingdom right it's quite clear when you see this given that the Romans were very much um, very much uh, uh, given to idolatry it's very very possible now legion in the Roman army in Jesus day was between 4,000 to 6,000 men so you know one devil is not really necessarily going to make a pig run down into the sea but maybe two or three possibly you know now each each um, and I'll go through these a bit clearer for you Now I want us to do a little bit of digging and a little bit of study on the Roman army because I think it will help us in spiritual warfare. In in the Roman army, the whole entire Roman army, there were 30 legions that made up the Roman army. 
So 30 legions. So there wasn't just one legion. There's 30 different legions. Right? And in spiritual warfare, we've come across legions of different sorts. Right? The legion is the strong man that binds other things together. Now within the legion, there are 10, usually 10 cohorts. And this is each led by a legate. Or legate. However you want to say it. Legate, legate. Now each cohort was normally made up of six centuries, commanded by a centurion. Now this is where it gets a bit difficult, because you'll find some sources that say that a century was 80, and others that say, well, a century is cent, which means 100. But the most commonly reported is that it was indeed 80 men. Now what I find is that at some point there were 100 men in a century, but then later on it was changed to 80 men, but they kept the name. They kept the name Century and Centurion, but he was no longer captain of a hundred men. He was captain over eighty. Now I'm going to go through this in a bit more and let you see a bit more. Now this is this is pretty fundamental for the Roman army, all right. And if you want to print out of these, we'll go through. But I'm going to go through it in stages here, all right? A century had debt, um, had ten decanus, right? Which was an eight-man tent party. So there was ten parts. And eight men in each part, which makes up the 80. Sometimes it was nine men. And each of them was co commanded by what we would call a sergeant today. Right? So you had, you had like eight men and a sergeant, sometimes nine men and a sergeant. Or eight men and a sergeant, nine. And then you had the centurion over all of these. This was then further broken down into um, quaternions, which is four men. And the scripture tells us about that. Tells us in Acts 12, verse 4. It says, When he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to, to, to four uh, quaternions of soldiers to keep him. All right, so that's the smallest break. And each one of these men was called a legionnaire. All right, so four legionnaires makes up uh, a quart, quaternion. Okay, the two quaternions makes up a decanus, which is commanded by that. Then you have ten decanus which makes a century. Okay, now we'll go through this. All right, I want you to understand this. Now here we have, um, here this is a tent group. So each one of these box, blocks here is a tent group. That's what it's called, a tent group. Okay, and so you can see, you basically have eight men here and a sergeant, or an equivalent of a sergeant. Okay, and so we have 10 of these all commanded by a centurion. Now the centurions were Basically, a low-level centurion would be about the rank of a, um, you know, like a warrant officer. That's about where you are. So, a, a, either a junior officer or warrant officer type. So, he's, you know, pretty well up in the terms of the enlisted men because these other men were, were not so. But um, he was, he was, he didn't, he didn't march. He rode on horseback. So he was at least he was elevated. But the higher centurions, because you could go through the ranks of centurions, so you could be a low-level centurion or a high-ranking centurion, depending which uh, cohort you were belong to. So you could be anything between a warrant officer, sergeant major, up to a captain in that way. So that's about where your ranking structure is. So that's the, about the rank system of the centurions. Then they go on to further things. So we have in this a centurion who governs all these men. So you've got these legionnaires and some little sergeants over the legionnaires. And of course, this man, this centurion, governs the ten sergeants and obviously all the other men. So it packs down. Then we come on to the cohort. Right? The cohort it consists of six centuries. So there's six centuries that answer to this legate or legate. Okay, however you want to say it. So there's he, the, these six men answer to him. So he was obviously higher than a, a captain. So you're talking about majors, uh, lieutenant colonels, colonels, uh, this way, up, up the way, up the way from there. Okay? So a normal cohort was about six centuries, which would have been about 480 to 600 men, is who, who he was be commanding. The first cohort in the Roman army was a double century. It consisted of five double centuries. So that means it was 800 to 1,000 men. And this was the elite. These were the elite of the elite. So these were the guys that were the, the, the elite soldiers, the special forces, if you like. Right? This specific uh, cohort was the ones that really knew what they were doing. 
Other cohorts included young soldiers, so new recruits, uh, weaker people, and uh, specialist troops as well. And so it was a mix up. But the first, if you were in the first cohort, you were an elite. You were one of the elite soldiers. Okay? So this is the cohort. And then we come, once we bring the cohorts together, we find that we have 10 cohorts. We see the number of one cohort at the front here, and then four, and then five at the back here. Okay? So this, is, this consists of one legion. All right, so we have the cohort, the large cohort here, this is the elite, and then perhaps some of the weaker ones in here, and then you know, slightly better forces on either side and whatnot coming up here. Now they did obviously structure themselves in different ways. You had cavalry, you had archers, you had different things like that. But this is the main structure of a legion. So when we talk about a legion, we're not just talking about one person. What I want you to understand is that we're talking about a structure within a structure. Right? We're not just talking about legion and then all these people underneath them. We're talking about legion divided into cohorts, divided into centuries, divided into decimus. You see? So Satan's kingdom has a rank structure, it occurs to me, through study and through experience, very similar to these things. A lot of times when we're doing deliverance, we go after the strong man sometimes first. Oftentimes that's difficult. Because why? It'd be like trying to go after Caesar. You've got to get through the Roman army first. Now what did Jesus say? We'll get to that here in a bit. Now let's look at Satan's kingdom for a minute. And like I said, it's very likely that the Roman army is based on the satanic kingdom by how they were given to idolatry. And how they communicated with the dead, or not with the dead, with the demons and with fallen angels, through all these ceremonies and everything like that, they would have probably got the rank tr structure from the way Satan has set his up. Now, Satan can only copy what God has. So it's entirely possible that God has a similar rank structure. But obviously God's rank structure is slightly different because we can see God's rank structure in the Bible. We can see God. We can see the chief angel. We can see the archangel. We can see chief angels. We can also see cherubim and seraphim. We can see different classifications of messenger angels. They don't seem to be as broken down as this is. It would just have a certain rank structure in God's kingdom. And we can see that from the scripture that each angelic entity has a rank within God's kingdom, within the celestial kingdom. Now, spiritual warfare, we often find that there are groupings of spirits. We find that certain things go together. Right? You're going to find that you, if you have a spirit of lust, there's going to be a, a perverse spirit with it, along with it. Um, you know, there's going to be different things. There's not going to be just one spirit. There's going to be a grouping of them, and they all come in groupings. So, when we see these groupings, we understand how they fit into centuries, into cohorts, and into legions. And we understand the legion is the one at the top that's binding these things together. Okay? Now, these each commanded, all these groupings are commanded by a legion strong man. Now, I'm going to show you something here. You might not be able to see it. It might be a, bit, a little bit um, small, but I couldn't fit it all in one page. But if you want a print out of this, this is not exhaustive. Okay, so I haven't covered everything on here because it's not possible. But for example, this is an example of one type of legion that we've encountered quite a lot. And we talk, we have the legion. So we have the legion commander, okay, the legion legate. Right, he's, the, he's the top commander of this one. Above him, you're probably talking about other chief angels you know, going on to this in Satan's kingdom. So we have the legion, and we have this common three group of cohorts. The cohort of Jezebel, the cohort of seduction, and the cohort of narcissism. Narcissus, narcissism. Okay? These we find usually go together. And this is one type of Jezebel that comes with Jezebel, seduction, and narcissism all together. You'll usually find that all three of these will be present in this grouping. If one of them is there, the other two will definitely be there. You'll always find that. Right? It's for, now, you might find narcissism in something else that doesn't necessarily come with uh, these things, but it might, it might, it won't necessarily be a strong man, it might be a trait. Um, you also, there'll be things like pride and things like that, that although it specifically goes with narcissism, there is another pride that goes along, right? Just because you have a pride spirit here doesn't mean to say you can't have a pride spirit over here, okay? They're different ones. So if we take, we've got Jezebel, we've got seduction, and we've got narcissism here, okay? And if we look at Jezebel, 
Underneath Jezebel, we've got other centuries, if you like, of rebellion, idolatry, and witchcraft. And that's only, I've only listed three there, just for brevity's sake. But I want you to understand that these would go with that. So with Jezebel, you're probably going to find rebellion, idolatry, and witchcraft, because that's the kind of character things that she brings to the table. With rebellion, you'll find self-will. With idolatry, you'll find false gods. With witchcraft, you'll find divination. Now here, in divination, you say, well, wait a minute, divination is quite a powerful thing. Yes, it is. But there's a, there are also, divination has its own legion. If somebody, Jezebel will have some form of div divination, but it might not be specific. It might be something s s simple like horoscopes or that. But when someone is well into witchcraft, they're going to have a legion of divination. So it's going to be a very powerful pythonous spirit, python spirit, in that way. So somebody's into to levitation, to um, actually fortune telling, doing the things themselves. Whereas Jezebel, in this witchcraft and divination, it might not be something they're doing, but something that they go to someone to see. For example, they look at their horoscopes, they go get their fortune told, but they're not necessarily the ones that are doing the fortune telling, if you understand what I mean. All right? So there will be, if someone is a, a fortune teller or a, a gypsy or something like that, they may well have a legion of witchcraft and divination that has in itself different cohorts of fortune telling, of necromancy, of, of these kind of things. So that has something all of itself. Okay? But um, we're looking specifically at this, at this concoction here of Jezebel seduction and narcissism. Right? Under seduction, we have perverseness. Right? So we have, we have a sexual seduction there. You know, it usually goes with Jezebel, there's a form of sexual seduction, where people use their sexuality to influence someone. There'll be mind control, and certainly an Ahab recruiter. You say, what's an Ahab recruiter? An Ahab recruiter is something that goes after to, to, to try and get people to become Ahabs to this Jezebel. That's why seduction comes with Jezebel. Because when Jezebel comes along, she needs to have an Ahab to be able to control that person. So perhaps this Jezebel comes on the scene and she wants to control or he wants to control someone. Right? Well, what, he need, what she needs to do is she needs to recruit an Ahab to come into that person so they're far easier to control. Or she might just go looking for Ahabs. So if somebody's a very strong Ahab personality, they'll tend to find or tend to seek out Jezebels so they'll go together. All right? So you will find that, and it's a lot easier for a Jezebel to seduce an Ahab than for Jezebel to seduce another Jezebel. That's very, very difficult. All right? So if somebody's an Ahab, pretty much guaranteed the other person that they're in a relationship with is probably a Jezebel and vice versa. I've never seen two Jezebels or two Ahabs together. Never seen it. There's always one or other. They may both have one of each. Like I've said before, you may have a strong Jezebel, and this is an Ahab, but perhaps this Ahab might have a Jezebel to someone else. It just it can go on and on. So we're looking at a different situation. So we have mind control here. Under mind control, we've got hypnosis, we've got triggers, we've got suggestion. Under perverseness, we've got things like lust, sodomy, adultery, and sexual impurity. Why? Because that brings in the perverseness of it as part of the seduction. The mind control is used. The likes of things like hypnosis. People sometimes don't know they're using hypnosis. Some people don't use, know they're building up triggers or, pardon me, making suggestions for people. So, so we can see that this thing would go together to bring in the Ahab to, um, to make it a lot easier to be seduced. And then obviously on this other side of the narcissist here, we have pride. We have the perfectionist. And then we have the affectation. Now, affectation is things like you know, oh, look at me, you know, just the, the flamboyancy and the overacting and the acting out, things like that, to, to get more attention. There's still finger pointing going on here. <laughs> and uh, under ego, under pride, we've got ego and vanity. Now, I'm only giving you a few examples here, right? I've got a list of common, deno uh, common uh, demonic groupings that we can see that are usually grouped together. But when we see them, when we see the structure that it is. Now let's look. We can see that these things here. Now let's look at them. I'll bring them up a bit so you can see them a bit better. Right? Okay, you can see them individually. Now here we have Jezebel. So you can see that we have rebellion. 
There's always going to be rebellion with Jezebel because she's a rebellious spirit. There's always going to be some form of rebellion. Either rebellion against husband or wife, rebellion against boss, there will be rebellion against God. There will be rebellion which will then in turn bring about self-will. Now with self-will, with rebellion, you can have things like self-will, um, you know, I want, I want to do, I have self-satisfaction. These things because it's what I want to do and not what God wants to do, right? Then idolatry, why idol worship? That's always going to bring in false gods. Why? Because all idols are false gods. So you can bring in things like uh, paganism, Buddhism, Shintoism, you know, any of these things that people get into, although they don't necessarily realize it's false god worship, it is false god worship. Trust is back to Baal. So you might have things like that in there. Now, again, within these kingdoms, there might be smaller kingdoms, but it's all part of the one big conglomerate. So this is all part of Jezebel's kingdom in here. And so when we see witchcraft and divination, so small things like that. No, no I mean, not, witchcraft is not necessarily small, but there's a difference in someone that reads the horoscope and somebody that makes the horoscope. There's a huge difference in that. You know, so it, it, it's... It's like the difference between somebody that makes a gun and somebody that uses a gun to shoot someone. You know, there's, there's a difference there. You know? but so we can see that that is a smaller entity in the Jezebel side. But again, this is not exhaustive. You say, well, if I deal with Jezebel, I'll deal with rebellion, idolatry, and witchcraft, and, and job done. That's not how it works. All right? That's not how it works. Um, you may have different Jezebels. There's not just one Jezebel. There's umpteen different Jezebels. You can have a Jezebel to 10 different people. And they have to 20 different people. You can have a Jezebel that's, that's in with seduction here. You know, there's so many here. Just because you pray against Jezebel once doesn't mean to say that you got rid of Jezebel. Right? This is a battle. And it's a battle that we have to take to its fullest extreme. So many people come and they do two hours of deliverance and think, hey, I'm delivered. Not so. Not so. You know, we think about how long battles take. What's the longest war that you know of on record? World War II. Still going on. Even so, it's still not the longest one. Longest conflict in record that you can think of. What? Same God. Physical, physical war. Longest one. World War, World War One, World War Two went on for a amount of years. Okay. We heard the Hundred Years' War. A long war. Long time. All right. To be honest, I think the longest running war is between the the children of Abraham. Between Isaac and Ishmael, because that's the longest running war, but uh, it's uh, you know it's been going on since then. It's still going on, right? But in the sense of actual conflicts, we can see that wars go on for a long time, right? If we look at the Second World War, we had a pivotal turning point called the Battle of Britain, pivotal per turning point for Britain, but that was 1940. When did the war end? So another five years, four and a half, five years it went on for before it was finally declared over. All right. So we can see that there are strategic battles that take place. And yes, we may have great victories in our lives, but we can never say that the war is over. All right. So we understand that in our, in our personage, we may have these different things. We need to take them down. We may have taken down foot soldiers, but we may not have taken down the big ones. And oftentimes you'll get lulled into a false sense of security thinking you've dealt with this and you haven't. Because oftentimes you're trying to do it by yourself and you may need reinforcements. So look at seduction right quick. Okay? Within seduction, there's the perverseness, the sexual side of it. There's the mind control to seduce someone to their way of thinking and also the Ahab recruiter. Because they're going to have to recruit Ahabs to do their work. Because the more Ahabs they can recruit, the easier it is to seduce someone. 
And if I want to seduce you, the best thing I can do is call for an Ahab to enter into you. And that's a lot easier for me because the Ahab wants to be controlled by the Jezebel. So that's what the seductress does, is comes in to seduce. Now see, she seduces, or he seduces, by lust, by sodomy, by adultery, and sexual impurity. And various other things in there. There's other things that will be along with those sexual things. All right? But for the sake of the children, I'm not going to go into those. Thank you. All right? <laughs> You're welcome. All right? But for us adults, we can pretty much think of certain addictions and certain practices that are done that uh, would, would be part of that. Mm -hmm. All right? You have things like whoredoms in there as well. In mind control, things like use of hypnosis, use of triggers, oops, what is that? Trigger words, somebody builds up a trigger and it's a form of hypnosis, right? To trigger someone, um, you know, and it's fairly easy to set up a trigger. You just do the same thing over and over and over again with a trigger point and so when you want them to trigger a certain behavior, you do say this certain word or this certain smell and it will instantly trigger that sensation, you know? if. Um, you know, there's, a, there's another way to get triggered, you know, if I keep tormenting somebody and you usually end up with that trigger as a slap on the forehead. Mm -hmm. All right. So there are many triggers, good or bad. Sometimes we can be triggered with a good rem memory. Sometimes a certain smell will bring back something that's very um, powerful, a very potent smell that will bring back pleasant memories to us. Other times it might bring back horrific memories. All right. Exactly. There's also suggestions. You can make a suggestion to someone. You're not really telling them what to do, but you make a suggestion, and then they start to believe it's their own idea, and you can work with it. And some people, that's the way you have to deal with them because they just, they're just, they're just stubborn. But um, if you make them think it's their idea, then they'll go with it. But this is part of mind control. This is all part of mind control to seduce the person into, into doing your bidding. Okay? Now again, there's many other things along with these, and then we could break up hypnosis into various points. We could break up lust and sodomy into various points, and adultery and impurity. We could break up these into other, uh, other minions, but for the sake of brevity, we'll just leave it. Because a lot of times these minions are very easy to deal with. It's these higher-ups that we need to strong men. Oftentimes, when you start coming against these things, the minions will just start abandoning ship, right? Which, incidentally, just I'm going to throw this out there. In the Roman army, there was a thing called uh, an aquilia, and uh, what his job was was to bear the eagle. Aquila it was the eagle, as we looked at the start. And his idea was to carry the eagle, and everyone would follow the eagle. Now. It was so important to the Roman soldiers to follow this eagle that when they were aboard a ship, it's, it's said that um, they, were, they were scared to go to battle. But this Aquilier, having no arm, just, just no arms, he just bare, bare the eagle, very prominent position, he jumped into the water with the eagle and started swimming towards where the battle was going to be. And so every other soldier, seeing that and not wanting to be embarrassed by not following, also jumped into the water and also swam to battle. So they were so uh, adamant that to follow this image that they, that they followed after it. So it seems as well, and that happens today, you see people that, are, that will follow something like that just for, just for the sake of, of not wanting to, to look bad. And um, so we see that, that again with Satan's kingdom as well, that they will follow this. And if that is torn down, you know, oftentimes they will flee. And then, of course, with a narcissist, narcissist. Now, it's not by any sense an exhaustive list on, on these things, but I just picked this one because it's one that we're quite familiar with. Uh, and within the narcissist, you'll have pride, you'll have perfection, you'll have affectation. Again, you can break those down. But like with pride, with ego, vanity, uh, perfectionist, everything is to be just so, um, you know, it's, 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 and pride, it's not my fault, never my fault, it's always your fault, you know. I could, I could have left that out there for you, you've tripped over it, but it was your fault for tripping over it. You know, kind of thing. You know, um, yes, I, I, I left my knife sitting upright on the couch, and you sat on it, and it went into you, but it's your fault for not looking before you sat down.
Did you sit on his knife? He <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, okay. So with the narcissist, you always you will find this. That everything else is your fault. Nothing is ever their fault. And if they do something wrong that you're upset, why are you upset? Why are you upset with me? I have done nothing wrong. That's your problem, and you need to get over it. You know, it's not me. It's not my fault. It's your fault for being upset. And so you'll find that with the narcissist, mm -hmm. right? That they will always look at that. So chances are, with that type of narcissist, you'll have the seductress and the Jezebel along with it, right? And all three of them will play their parts. Sometimes you'll be thinking you're dealing with Jezebel, you're actually dealing with Narcissus. Sometimes you might think you're dealing with Narcissus, but it's actually Jezebel. You see, but it's always fuel in this way. And what we see is we see the legion at the top that binds Jezebel, Narcissus, and uh, seduction together. Now, so what do we do? How do we come against this? Well, we have to follow scriptural principles. And Jesus tells us how to do it. And that is to bind the legion. He says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 29, or else how can one enter into the strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Okay? So the first thing we need to do is what, if whatever we're dealing is bind the legion that we are dealing with. Now, the other day we dealt with a woman that had five different legions we dealt with. Five different legions. Now, they weren't terribly strong legions but they were legions altogether. Now, what we did was we bound the strong men, the legion, we bound the, the legions, and then we started picking off the individual ones. And it was a lot easier to deal with it that way. Rather than trying to work from the ground up, you know, we start, we bound the one, we didn't attack the strong men first, we bound the strong men. You know, in, in Jesus' name, we bind the strong men, and then they cannot, it's like shooting the officers. You take out the officers, and it's very hard for the soldiers to do, know what they're doing. So we bind the legion on top, because the legion is the one that, that holds Jezebel, Narcissus, and seduction together. So we bind legion. And then we start taking down each individual kingdom. You may start with Jezebel's kingdom, or you may start with seduction's kingdom. You know, I suggest leaving Narcissus to last. All right? Do Jezebel and seduction. If you've got, come across this grouping, leave Narcissus to last. Right? Because then Narcissus has lost the powers of Jezebel and seduction, and so he can take it down. So if we start with Jezebel first, we start coming against her minions, those little things that she does. Start tearing down those, confessing those things as sin, um, breaking any soul ties that have given way to this. Any, any places where Jezebel controls an Ahab, break you. If you know that you have a Jezebel to someone's Ahab, and you know that you're, you, you control them, Start breaking those soul ties because then her power is weakened. Start taking her down, bring her down, casting her out, loosing the spirit power of Elijah upon her. Take her down, take down seduction because you know the batting of the eyelids and the combing of the hair. You know, we need to start taking down those sexual sins as well because that's a big, big part of seduction is the sexual sins. You say, Well, I know that a person doesn't use sexuality to influence doesn't have to. Those things are there. Anything that's against the Bible sexually will come in these things. Yeah. Right? And sometimes these are very, very difficult to get rid of because one must be completely submitted to doing it God's way and wholly God's way and not just because we think we've got a scripture to fit. And we say, oh, we can defend that because that's what Solomon was alluding to. No, 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 no. Now, we can bend scriptures all we want to, yeah. all right? But sodomy is sodomy, and God's way is God's way. Yeah. That's just the way it is, okay? So we first bind the legion, then we start taking down the individuals. And once we've taken down the individuals, then we can cast out the legion. Why? Because he's no longer needed. But if you start trying to take out the legion before you've taken out these, it's going to be impossible because he's got so much ground, mm -hmm. right? There are cords, that I've discovered is sometimes you find that, that there's a cord hanging on to this legion. He's hanging on by one cord. And it's essential that we take down that cord. We snap that cord and take down that kingdom and then that legion can leave because he's got nothing else to do. Right? He's powerless. He has no army left. 
He has nobody to command, so he can easily be get, get thrown out. Whereas if he's got still a whole legion to command, how are you going to throw him out? What did Jesus say? Bind them first. Bind the strong man first, mm -hmm. then spoil his house, and then kick him out. Right? Mm -hmm. and this, in Luke chapter 11, verse 21, he says, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Right? But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overthrow him, he taketh from him all his armor where he trusted, and divideth his spoils. And this is the same context, although it's a different book. It's the same context and the same thing that Jesus was saying. Whereas Luke thought it prevalent to put this in, whereas Matthew didn't. But I mean, we can say we see the same strong man. Right? When the strong man is in charge of this area, he is good. But when something stronger comes, for example, if somebody starts off with a lesser Jezebel and a stronger Jezebel comes in, something more powerful comes in, then it takes charge and that one's relegated. And so what we find oftentimes when we're dealing with spiritual warfare is we may take down one Jezebel and then another Jezebel springs up. And we take out that one and another one springs up. Why can they not, why are they repressed? Because they, the, these ones are stronger. All right, so oftentimes we find that they might deal with one, after, one strong man after another. Why? Because they were the last powerful. But now that the stronger one is gone, they can come to the forefront. And then we start picking them off one by one until we get them gone. And it's very important that we do this. Now sometimes, it's, it was sometimes interrogation can be used to find out the structure of that. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus asked, there's a man his name, and we're not communicating with them. It's interrogating like you interrogate a prisoner. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus asked his name, asked the legion, so he understood what was going on. Um, because you'll notice Jesus commanded it to come out, and it did not come out. Then Jesus asked it his name. And once the name was revealed, then it wanted to go into the pigs. And Jesus said, go. And they went into the pigs. It's not always necessary to find out a demon's name. It's not always necessary. In fact, it's very rarely. Sometimes they'll just claim that you have to say it properly. And sometimes we found that some of them get annoyed because you say it wrong. Well, I do that sometimes on purpose just to work them up. But it works. But if we bind the legion first, we bind the things that are holding it together, that means there's no command structure. They're bound, the legion is bound, he cannot give commands, so you have then your three cohorts, or four, five, six, ten cohorts, are without a supreme commander, if you like, of that. So they're individuals, so you can basically start civil war. You can, they can almost fight against each other. And we see that from what God did in, in, the, in, in the scriptures. Right? When they blew the horns, they confounded it. And what happened? Everybody started fighting each other. We do the same principle. And when we study how, how the Israelites warred against their enemies, you can use the same things, the same principles, to fight against the devil's kingdom. Use those same principles as well. So when you see what, what um, Joshua did, or what Gideon did, we can see how God uses these things. And sometimes we think, hey, this is... This is ludicrous. This is something that's a bit weird. But God's ways are not our ways. Amen. Sometimes God may tell you to do something. You think, what is going on here? And you do it. And guess what? It works. Why? Because God told you to do it. And God knows what he's doing. So in the sense of legion, when we come across these things, and I'm going to do a lesson next week on why they won't come out. Because sometimes we pray about things and we cast things out and we tell them to come out and they just won't go. Right? Sometimes that happens, right? What do we do, right? Do we give up? No. What we do is we bind it until we can figure things out. You bind them. You bind those legions. You bind the cohorts where they can't afflict the person. And then you figure out what it is. Now, there's a couple of things it might be. One, the person's not willing to give that up. Number two, there might be a narcissist behind them that is not allowing them to give it up, right? Or there may be unforgiven sin, um, generational curses, there's a lot of things it could be. So we'll look at next week uh, dealing with those specifically and how to find out what is still uh, binding those things together if these tactics haven't worked. Any questions?
Yes. I don't have a question. It's just um, the the armor that Paul described. Because the warfare is pretty much on the Roman structure, which is what Satan's kingdom. I think is that why Paul also gave us the the armor of God as he was king of prisons, looking at the Roman yeah, soldiers. Yeah, I would believe so. Yeah. yeah. I would believe so. It just seems to me that that's how they, and if you think about how successful the Roman army was, and how successful that that weaponry that they had was, it makes sense that Paul would would use that same analogy for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Hmm? They, do leave. they do leave, yes. But we have to be willing and ready to give up stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's the question. If we want freedom, we've got to give stuff up. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, if we want clarity of mind, if we want peace of mind, if we want peace, if we want these things, there are some things that God may tell us to give up. Right? But we've got to be willing to admit that we've got a problem. Because um, anybody that tells me that um, you know they've been delivered, yeah, sure, yeah, that's that's usually my first question. It's like you may have been delivered from this, but you have not. Usually, I, I've never found anybody's been fully delivered. Because a lot of times, even with ourselves, we'll come to a point where we'll think, "Wow," and then we'll have a deliverance, an impromptu deliverance session, and we'll realize something that um, you know was was huge. And so you never, you never ever say that I've been through full deliverance. Never, never say that. Uh, because there's always things that could come up. And there's always things that we, we know. There's always things to learn. Because if we don't know something's wrong, how can we be delivered from it? Right? Or if we're unwilling to admit that something's wrong, we cannot be delivered from it. So this is, this is important as well. Kidoki. Anything else?